Welcome back to That's a Good Word, a podcast designed to assist and equip Christians through advice from people in ministry. If you are blessed by our content, we'd appreciate if you liked and subscribed to our YouTube channel, and feel free to follow us on any of our social media content as well. It is a great honor to welcome on the podcast Will Snipes today, middle school teacher at Blue Ridge uh, Middle School, and he is very involved in the local community and discipleship of young adults and uh, very involved with with churches um, in this area and has, has been in the Blue Ridge TR area for a long time. So, Will, thank you so much for coming on. Really thank appreciate you. it. It's great to be here. Yes, sir. And I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to go ahead and share your testimony. Just tell us how you came to know the Lord, and then we'll talk about your story as well. Okay. Thanks so much, Wilson. Side note, I was Wilson's teacher in seventh grade, too. So yes. Fun fact. I, I was probably... I hope I, I hope I'm better now. It's probably a real Whatever. pain in seventh grade. But. I hope everybody is better now <laughs> right. than they That's were right. in seventh grade. Yeah, we don't want to peak in right. seventh grade. <laughs> um, so thanks so much, Wilson. I've really been looking forward to this. I've been excited about this. Um, my story. I grew up in Columbia, so sometimes people don't know that because I have been here for a long time in TR and in the Blue Ridge area. But I grew up in Columbia. Grew up going to church. Grew up in church a lot. Um, Sunday school. Big church, we called it, um, children's choir, RAs, all those kind of things. Um, kind of a significant thing for me, too, was called the Good News Club, which I think now is mostly in schools. Right. Elementary schools will have Good News Club. At the time, there was a lady in our neighborhood that did Good News Club, and she did it at her home, and um, kids would go there, and course there was a snack involved but she would do the bible stories and the songs and things like that so i have real distinct memories of that i have real distinct memory of praying with her to receive christ mm -hmm. at a good news club at her house probably around age eight um and then i think my story kind of takes a little bit of a different turn um a lot of times than people would think um so through middle school and high school i was not really plugged into any kind of youth ministry which Youth ministry is so important to me now, and um, I just see such a, a purpose in that, in that formative time for students. But for me, um, I wasn't doing a lot of bad stuff, but I just never felt like um, I fit in there. We were part of kind of a larger church. Uh, my sister was sort of involved with youth things, but I just never found my place there. And mm -hmm. so um, one of the things that's been really interesting for me Along the way, somewhere fairly recently, I was uh, studying the story of the prodigal son, and I was looking at the role of the older son in that story, and I really started to see a lot of myself in that mm -hmm. older son, um, just in his righteousness and goodness for his, his own glory, and um, I kind of see myself that way, and I don't want to paint myself in too dark of a light, but... Through high school particularly, I think I was a really good kid, so I don't have that testimony of a bunch of terrible, bad things I've ever done. But um, I was a good kid, but for the wrong reasons. I was a good kid for my own attention, for my own glory, for adults to come to me and say, what a great person you are and others need to be around you. But it was never to point people towards Christ. It was just to feel good about myself. And so um, that's kind of an interesting time in my life. Um, but I'm really thankful that uh, in college and particularly after college, really, um, it's when God really just started to work on me, started to use me um, in ways that I hadn't imagined or seen. Obviously, um, we never know how he's going to work and what right. he's going to do. Um, but I started getting involved with the local church here. Once I had graduated, I came here to go to Furman. It's kind of how I ended up in this area. Right. Decided to become a teacher. Um Knew that I wanted to be involved in church, had been involved with church through college, but never again in a real serious way. Um, but started getting involved, went to camp with them, started teaching Sunday school, started working with the youth, uh, kind of found a love and a passion there that I didn't know I had. Mm -hmm. um, the beginnings of teaching for me, I was teaching elementary school. I taught first grade for eight years before I came to Blue Ridge and thought that's where I wanted to be and that's the age I wanted to work with. 
Um, but God was working through all of that. Right. Um, so I think like a lot of people, it's a long, gradual process that you look back and you see where God has taken you from and, and where God has led you to. Mm-hmm, definitely. There, there, there's times in the Christian life um, where you might not know what God is doing. And I, sh- I, I, I can um, think of times in my own life where I didn't know what God at the moment was doing and what he was working, but I can look back even Absolutely. as a young person. I, I, I believe that you know in your life you probably have many places where you can look and say, I had no idea what was going on right there, what God was doing. Um, I didn't think I was going to end up where I did, but I can see God working in all those areas. Can can you kind of attest to, you know, how God has worked in, in areas in your life and how you've been able to see kind of the um, God's, you know, hand on even the spots where you, you know, were, weren't sure what was going to happen next? Absolutely. One thing that comes to mind really quickly is just, I don't think we acknowledge enough that the Lord protects us from things. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the things that people were involved with in high school or college, I really feel like God just protected me from those things. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't give me a lot of interest in those things, even though I wasn't really living um, the Christian life fully and experiencing really the joy that God has for us. Right. He was still protecting me. He was still very present in that. That's right. I think because he has a had a plan, had a plan. Um, another thing that I think of is just, you know, that the the abilities or the gifts that I have to teach or to speak um, were completely from him, and he was developing those. So one thing that I did a lot in high school was I was in some plays. I was in some plays at college. I love being on stage. I loved right. speaking. I loved capturing the attention of people. And then I think God began to combine that. I've never seen myself as a teacher. I didn't go to college to be a teacher. Um, but he led me to that through a volunteer opportunity that I had working in a local school. Yeah. All of a sudden, I found myself really interested in teaching, education, being in the school setting. So really, you look back, and I, some of this Wilson's just coming to me right now, so that's awesome. Um, but you look <laughs> back, and you're like, okay, he's developing me as a teacher. He's developing yeah. me as a speaker. He's developing my ability to connect with an audience or to be comfortable in front of people. Mm-hmm. Um, he's protecting me from a lot of things um, to prepare me for what he had for me. That's right. It's amazing because you know we, we certainly have things we wish we would have done differently, but I think if we look back at our life, we, we're happy the way it worked out, and we don't think we don't want it to uh, have gone differently. Um, we're thankful that God worked the way He did because He is sovereign over our life. And uh, if you if you you know kind of change if you were to look back, you know, and, and talk to your younger self, you're able to go back in time and talk to yourself, maybe right at that turn from high school to college, um, when you know your Christian life took a took a turn. Uh, if you were to go back to that that time and talk to that very young Christian self of your of yours, what would you say? How what would you tell them? Like, hey, what advice would you give to them? Absolutely. Um, you know, I don't like to use buzzwords, but I do think the word community is incredibly important. And in a Christian sense, I didn't have that mm-hmm. a lot through high school. I had community with a lot of non-believers, to be honest. But um, that's something that I know I could have benefited from. Obviously, I'm always going to say. The earlier you get into scripture and you begin to learn scripture and know where things are in scripture and be familiar with with scripture and being able to find things and um and and learn and grow from that is something i wish i had started a whole lot earlier Mm. because we can never exhaust what god has for us there so in some ways i think i i felt like i was kind of playing catch up through a lot of that because I, i knew stories of the bible but i didn't know really any of the depths that we could go to in God's word. So That's right. um, community for young people is so important. I always tell guys that are going off to college, like you have the opportunity to grow so much in college. You have a lot more time in your schedule. You have a lot more flexibility and freedom in your mm-hmm. schedule as a college student. Mm-hmm. And I know college students are are busy, but they, they got a lot of downtime too, which That's sometimes right. goes to like naps and video games. <laughs> but um, time to you know, be part of a small group to um, really go deeper into your faith in college, I think. I'm always excited when I see a young man take that path um, early on in college instead of other paths that he might have right. chosen from. So I would right. do that. I would recommend that for myself as well. Right. Perseverance in the Christian life is a difficult thing. Um, I remember when I became a Christian, you know, you, you kind of start out, you think, oh, this is, this is awesome, this is easy. Um, you you very quickly learn that there's there's battles in the Christian life and there are uh, there's spiritual warfare 
Um, there's difficulty, life hits you kind of fast. And, um, uh, you know, kind of as a young person that, that hits you very hard. Um, as someone who has persevered in the Christian life, you, you know, you've run the race well, what would you attest to per, your perseverance? Um, what have you done to be able to stay disciplined and, um, keep, keep, keep that drive? Um, how have you persevered as a Christian? It's a great question. Um, we were just talking about a song lyric the other night um, with a group of guys. Uh, it says, the joy of my salvation shall be my final breath. Mm-hmm. So I think as much as we can keep our, you know, as Paul says, keep your eye focused on the prize and realize the joy of our salvation is not going to be taken from us. And that's right. that's what I'm living for. That's what I'm I'm chasing after. And it was neat to see these probably high school freshman guys realize like, my final breath will be still the joy of my salvation. Right. Um, that helps me persevere. I think looking into Scripture, Wilson, and seeing, um, you know, I've studied this story a lot before, but I know God has something new for me there. Mm-hmm. Um, helps me to persevere, not only my own walk, but in in teaching and speaking and going into God's Word and saying there's something new for me here every single time. Right. Um, and then I, another thing I love is the opportunity to teach or to study a passage that I haven't taught before. Mm-hmm. So an example would be last summer at camp. It was recommended um, possibly for one of the nights of worship to teach the story where Jesus gets the coin and talks about paying your taxes to Caesar. And, and you know, a story that I had read, but a story I'd never taught, a story I'd never really um, gone into in a deep way. And so it was... It took work, but it was rewarding to see. Here's something that um, that I had a lot to learn from, and I had the privilege to share with other people that was new to me. So, right. um, again, I think I've already said we can't exhaust what God's Word has for us, and mm-hmm. so that's a big part of persevering, I think, is just continuing to go back there and say, what else is in here? and What's in here for where I am in life right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's great advice, too, for someone who might be a young Christian going through the Bible for the first time. They might think, well, I finish, you know, I've gone from Genesis right. to Revelation one time. I guess I'm done now. But, you know, you can, as someone who's read through the Bible multiple times, you can say, no, there's, you actually, you actually learn more. You, you mean, you, you, you learn more each time you go through. So that, that, I think that's, that's a great, you know, great advice to young Christians um, as well. Now, you, you went into the public, public school realm, um, became a public school teacher. And, uh, I imagine things were a little bit different when you started to to now. Sure. But um, being a Christian witness in in public school in the public school you know realm there, you know how 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 have you navigated that? Because I know that's that's something that that can be at times challenging. We watch the news and see see certain things, but um, you know how have you been able to be a Christian witness while also being a public school teacher? Great question. Um, I'll tell you a little bit too, just of my story of. Um, Working in Greenville County Schools for eight years as a first grade teacher down mm-hmm. kind of West Greenville, Whitehorse Road area. Um, but I was working at camp. I was working at Fuge Camp by this point in the summer. And so in the summer of 2000, um, my roommate at camp and my director at camp were both middle school teachers. And obviously at camp, we have middle school and high school students. So I'm surrounded by them for eight or 10 weeks in the summer. But these two individuals, particularly, um, both as middle school teachers were just really, God was using them that summer to encourage me. Right. You should consider teaching middle school. I said, absolutely not. No, I don't want to, I only want to teach first grade. I don't want to teach middle school. I, I distinctly remember Wilson saying, I like middle schoolers at camp. Mm-hmm. Middle schools are great at camp. I don't want to teach middle schoolers. Um, we were in Philadelphia that summer was our location for camp. So we're pretty far from home. Um, God was really working on me that summer and, some great ways and circumstances and interactions. And um, so towards probably the end of July, all of a sudden I'm like, I want to teach middle school. But I'm, you know, 14 hours from home and packed up a classroom um, at a school with all my things for first grade. I love where I worked. I love the people I worked with. Um, But through a phone call to Blue Ridge Middle School uh, and talking with the principal on the phone, Mm -hmm. she had an opening and I, I went from teaching first grade to teaching eighth grade, hmm. which was the 
the boundaries of my certification. They don't even do certification that way anymore because they're like, that's too wide of an area for somebody to be able to teach anything. Back then, you could teach anything, first grade to eighth grade, anything. Wow. And so I went from first grade to eighth grade at Blue Ridge Middle School. I didn't know a thing about Blue Ridge Middle School. I did not know that community. I knew TR. Um, I did not know how to find Blue Ridge Middle School. We did not have GPS. Um, it was a whole new world for me. Right. And I loved it from day one. Um, so that's kind of how God got me there. Um, and I always, always want to praise him for that. A lot of mornings when I'm driving to Blue Ridge Middle School, um, I'm just thinking about how he... He literally picked me up and put me down in that place. Right. Um, as far as your question, sorry for that long oh, no, you, no, <laughs> explanation of how I got there. You're but um, for your question, there's a there's a line that we walk. Um, but in this community, I've always been thankful for uh, a lot of the leadership that we have in our schools. A lo- obviously, a lot of the families that we have in our schools, a lot of the involvement that our local churches have in our schools right. for the release time program. Um, for Greer Christian Ministries, um, which does so much at Blue Ridge and Greer High Schools and middle schools. Um, But for me personally, just because I am in a lot of churches around here, speaking, doing youth events, doing weekends, just knowing kids, knowing their families. Side note, teaching kids now that I taught their parents, which is becoming more and more of a thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think it allows me to walk into school and I don't have to wear a t-shirt or yeah. proclaim to my class that I'm a believer in Christ because that is against the rules, but they know, they know who I am. They associate me um, maybe with having been at their church or their brother or sister knowing me or their brother being in Bible study with me or their parents knowing me. Mm-hmm. And I think it just sets up kind of an interesting situation where they, I've always thought this where I think they kind of observe you in a little bit different way, mm. even as a middle school student. Right. Like, is this person who I know is a Christian in our community, is this person really kind? Is this person gentle? Is this person patient? Um, because those are um, tests for middle school teachers mm-hmm. to to be patient with people that are sometimes hard to be, you know, almost always hard to be patient with. Right. Um, right. To be kind, to be gentle, to be um, careful with your words, to be encouraging, to be all those um, things, you know, we're we're supposed to put those things on like we put on clothing in the morning. And um, so wearing those things to school every day can be a challenge. But I feel like students knowing who I am and what I stand for um, gives me that opportunity to show that whether I'm preaching the gospel or not. Right. Um, And then through things, too, like I I had the privilege of leading FCA at our school. Um, Obviously, based on the way that's set up, I'm going to be able to help facilitate that. I'm going to get it set up. I'm going to get it announced. I'm going to pick the donuts up. But we're going to have different people coming in to speak. Um, But just that that role in that in that organization kind of puts me in front of students, in a sense, as a leader in that. Right. and there are things, you know, we we read, we're reading right now The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe as we finish the year up. Mm. Um, and we read this nonfiction article about C.S. Lewis. Right. And it talks about C.S. Lewis's faith and his, um, I think, kind of walking away or wandering away from faith at one point and then getting around some of those guys like Tolkien and, and really figuring out what he believed. And we read this article and we answer some questions about this article and they learn about religions of the world as part of the sixth grade social studies curriculum. Right. So they're primed and ready to read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe just because it's a great story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then that light bulb comes on in in some of them. And they say, hey, this is sort of like this. And I just simply say, well, remember we read that article about C.S. Lewis and he's coming from a Christian background. And I think you might be right about what this stands for, what this represents. What he's what he's doing here symbolically, and so those wheels are turning in a way that I think is pretty awesome. Oh yeah, absolutely. One thing you mentioned I thought is was very important is that you know you were involved in other other things. You know you weren't on the sidelines. You were um, you were doing ministry type things. FCA. You were involved in local church, and that's so important. You know, as someone that's um, you, you're using your time, sacrificing your time 
um, to be involved in other things. And, and, and that is what kind of caused this, your students to know, hey, this, this person's a Christian. Mm-hmm. And if you weren't involved in those things, um, if you were, if you were, you know, quote unquote, sitting on the sidelines, then those people might not have known, you know, your your testimony or your background um, as a Christian. So I believe that it's very important, you know, that you were involved in doing things and helping those students. And it's a great call for other Christians to be involved, you know, be involved in the in the lives of your students. Um, you weren't just day a day, you know, five days a week, clock in, clock out. You were involved in your students' lives, and I think that's uh, that's a great testament and very important. And uh, it, you know, it made it, it made your students comfortable around you, and you were able to start, you know, Bible studies and, and, and things like that. Um, how did that? What was the motivation to start? Mm-hmm. You know, working with these students one on one, doing some small groups. It's a great a great story. Um, praise the Lord. So I arrived. At Blue Ridge Middle in 2000, for the first couple of years, I was still mainly connected more to the TR community in terms of church. Our youth group at the time at um, First Baptist of Traveler's Rest was very active, and I was a big part of that and loved that, um, and was was making some good connections with some, some guys in um, Blue Ridge and Blue Ridge Middle and their families and would spend some time with them and hang out with them. But it's really the summer of 2005. Uh, we had a infuge camp, which is our ministry-based camp in the country of Ecuador. So I was actually in Ecuador for about a month that summer. And I remember there was a, a youth group that came from the Atlanta area somewhere. And they had some guys in that group that were juniors and seniors that were just really solid. They, they had a ton of fun. They had a lot of leadership. Um, but they loved the word. They were very attentive during worship. They were great in our Bible study groups. Um, I could just tell they were, um, had been developed really, really well as Christian young men. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of made an impact on me. And I was there. Um, It's great. Like uh, Dr. McWhite has been to this place many times. A lot of people in our community have been to this camp in Ecuador. There's a big volcano right in front of you, which is kind of a cool place to reflect on life. Um, But I was sitting there. One afternoon, um, just spending time with the Lord, thinking, praying, and God specifically told me in just one of those God moments, start a Bible study with some guys when you get back. Um, I was teaching seventh grade at the time, so these guys would be going into eighth grade um, because this would be the summer before their eighth grade year, and there were really just three of them that God brought to mind that I'd hung out with them, we'd maybe been out running one day after school, going for a milkshake, something. I kind of had a connection with them. Their families knew them, knew me, so I wasn't going to be some random guy. Um, But the Lord told me, start a Bible study with these guys and disciple them and mentor them um, because it's possible for young men to have a heart after God. And so came back, did that. We did start with three guys at somebody's house, which has always kind of been our model um, it's, it's going to be in the evening. So it's not during school time. It's right. going to be in someone's home. Um, so they've opened their home, which means they know me and, um, respect me and invite me into their home. They're going to serve us a meal, which is always a nice perk. Um, right. but we started with those three guys. Um, and that grew not in a huge way, but grew to probably eight or 10 guys, um, there in the 2005, 2006 school year, those guys would end up graduating in 2010. Um, and from there, uh, the Lord just blessed so much, and it just kind of became a thing. And really the way that it happened, I love to tell this story, is a kid that year that was in seventh grade, he was hanging out with me one day, and um, I had I had the eighth grade Bible study that night. It was really just kind of more like a small group at that point. And he he came to it with me. He, I was like, why don't you just come with me? We're going over here to this house. So he came with me and he told me that night, he said, I want to have something like that when I'm in eighth grade with my friends. Because right. there is something about being in a Bible study just with guys and just with guys that you go to school with. Um and so the next year we started that group. So the next year I had a group in ninth grade and a group in eighth grade. Hmm. Um, and the same thing happened again. It happened with a seventh grade kid who was hanging out with me. 
I knew his family. He came to Bible study. He said, I want to have something like that next year with my friends. And so the next year we had 10th grade, 9th grade, 8th grade. And it wow. just kind of grew from there. Yeah. Um, and eventually we had to go to an every other week model because I basically ran out of nights of the week. Because right. um, I don't do Wednesday nights. I don't do Friday nights. So that basically leaves me Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, so along at that point, at some point we went to a, uh, like a every other Monday, a every other Tuesday was kind of our format. Um, and I want to say, I, I always encourage these guys, you know, you need to be part of a local church. I don't want this to be your your church. Right. I think you need to be part of a local student ministry. We have so many awesome ones around here. I have really great connections with a lot of the churches around here, so I can encourage kids to get involved there. Um, but I want this to be something extra. You right. know? I want right. you... Um, to be in a church and be in a student ministry and 100% there. But this opportunity to be with a group of guys that are in school with you, um, that you probably play sports with, that you probably spend time with, and we are represented by lots and lots of different churches, lots of denominations, and some guys, honestly, who aren't in church, mm -hmm. some guys whose families aren't churched at all, and this is kind of their one place, you know? Right. So right. it's it's just sort of a wide variety, and God has blessed it so much. Right, that's awesome. Uh, small group discipleship is very is very important, and it's a, it's a topic in the church today. Um, you know, people like to pinpoint different areas and where maybe the church in America could um, improve. And I think discipleship is one that a lot of people, you know, I know in the Southern Baptist Convention and, and other places are focusing on. So as someone who's who's done that, who's done a lot of one-on-one -on -one discipleship, has done a lot of group, small group discipleship, um, in, has started a Bible study. And maybe there's someone out there listening that wants to start a Bible study or is interested in how how that works. Uh, how did you, you know? You already talked about how you started it and what you and what you did. Um, working with the kids through Scripture, though, you know, what what where did you start there? Mm -hmm. And just how did you kind of build that community uh, around Scripture and learning together? Yeah, um, I think there's things that, that the guys have always responded well to, and one of them is being in homes, mm -hmm. having a more intimate feel, being outside the walls of the church, being comfortable, maybe in a little different way, obviously having food. Um, for the younger guys, the eighth and ninth grade guys, they're going to be playing basketball and throwing football when I get there. Right. The junior and senior guys are going to be, all their trucks are going to be parked up and down the street, and right. they're probably going to be sitting there talking about what they've been doing with their trucks. <laughs> um, so just kind of yeah. watching that change over over their eighth grade and high school years. Um, consistency is huge. So we are going to meet, you know, starting in the fall, usually September, once school's kind of back in. If you're a senior, we're meeting every other Monday night. Right. And I really kind of build my schedule around that, which can be difficult sometimes. But with very few exceptions, uh, we're not going to cancel. We're not going to change things. Um, it's going to be every other Monday night. And mm -hmm. sometimes we have a, a good size, healthy crowd, and everybody responds to numbers, whether we like that or not. So everybody's like, wow, we got a good crowd here tonight. And sometimes because of whatever commitments or whatever comes up, our crowd might be a little bit off. Right. Um, I think just being consistent through that, and that can be a struggle for me too, of not just being like, wow, not too many people showed up tonight. Right. But I want the people that showed up to hear from the Lord and be blessed. Right. Um, in terms of what we study, God's just led me to um, lots of different, usually a series um, either something that I'm reading or something that I'm studying, mm -hmm. and God's just turning the wheels constantly about, you could take this and teach this to the guys. This would be applicable to them. Um, and I do, over over a four-year span, I try to keep pretty good records, but I'll bring something back and teach it again. So we have a series on Daniel um, that God led me to many, many years ago, and I want everybody at some point from ninth grade to 12th grade, I want them to hear that series on Daniel, right. um, which then leads into some of the prophecies, some of the end times things, some revelation stuff, some heaven stuff, um, bringing in the book Heaven by Randy Alcorn. All that's just kind of a package deal. Right. And I want everybody to hear that at some point. Um, one thing that I should mention is um, with, with our ninth graders through 12th graders, I teach the same lesson to all four of those groups. Mm, okay. 
um, which makes it easier for me, but it also means for them, the ones that are really dedicated, if you can't come to senior Bible study on Monday night because it's your mom's birthday and you're going out with your family, that's awesome. Then you can come to junior Bible study on Tuesday, or you can come to sophomore Bible study next Monday because mm-hmm. it's going to be the same lesson. Right. And so it's encouraging to me and um, just an, a testament about who they are. Um, not all of them will take advantage of that. Not all of them have a calendar or know how to use it, but right. they will look ahead and say, hey, Snipes, I can't come Monday night. When can I make it up? Right. And when they do, that means a lot to me. Um, so that's kind of where my little four-year rotation thing comes in. At some point in a four-year span, we're going to do that study. Yeah. Um, we just did the Fruit of the Spirit and spent time really, you know, they could rattle them off. A lot of them could rattle them off. Right. Um, but what does it mean to... Um, to experience the joy that the Spirit has for us, the peace, the patience. Mm-hmm. Um, what is gentleness? You know, what is self-control? We had a really, really good series on that. I want to bring that back, but I won't bring it back for several years because these guys, ninth through twelfth, have had the opportunity to hear that. Right. So that's kind of how we're formatted. Uh, it's just always worked really well for us. Um, and then every once in a while, I'll be reading something new or listening to a series myself from a pastor and think, you know, this is something I want to develop up Mm -hmm. for the guys. So God's been really, really good to keep that coming. Right. One of the great things that you get to see is growth. You can see the kids who were in ninth grade Bible study and then see them in 12th grade Bible study and see how they've grown over time. And um, that that's one thing about discipleship that's so, you know, rewarding is you can see the growth of, of young individuals um, do you have some stories about maybe some specific students or just, you know, some, you know, a group of students that you really saw grow mm-hmm. over Absolutely. time and, yeah. um, and how, how great that was? I mean, we've got, we've got guys now in ministry, which is nothing could be more rewarding than that. But right. we've also got guys teaching at Blue Ridge High School. And I love that. Yeah. And I love yeah. to say, um, to a guy who's in ninth or 10th grade and he's playing football and Coach McKinney is his, is his football coach or his track coach. And I'll say, you know, Coach McKinney used to come to Bible study. Mm, like, yeah. ask him about it. Or Coach McKinney's already told him, you know, right. hey, I hope you get to go to Snipes' Bible study. Right. So that's that full circle moment. For sure. Of, um, you know, and the, and the Lord doesn't have to do that, but he chooses to do that. He chooses mm-hmm. to reward us and bless us and let us see the fruit. You know, he doesn't have to do that. Um, and it's not why we do what we do, but um, to see guys um, as worship leaders now in local churches, as uh, seminary students, seminary graduates, pastors, uh, missionaries. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a guy right now, he's just tremendous, a uh, North Greenville grad that's um, going to be leaving and um, serving in Egypt and wow. just the opportunity to wow. to have seen him in high school and um, for him to have texted me one night and, and he said, I really need to talk to you. And uh, I said, okay, let's meet at Chick-fil-A tomorrow morning really early, which I really didn't want to do. <laughs> um, but that's where he told me that he felt God had called him to missions mm. as wow. a junior probably in high school. Wow. Yeah. I had the opportunity to take him to the Philippines. So we do some mission trips um, and we went to the Philippines in 2018, and I worked with IMB missionaries down there over Christmas and New Year's. And um, to see now that he has graduated from North Greenville, that he's married, that they're called together and they're going to Egypt. Wow, um, that's awesome. That's, you know, I don't deserve to get to see that, but it sure is great to right. be blessed by seeing that. Right, absolutely. Um, one thing, and this might be a little bit off, you know, off the map, but one thing that you can you know, attest to is you see what these kids are going through and, you know, in middle school and high school, you know, the struggles that they face. And uh, for many churches, you know, they might not know how to, how to approach young people because um, this is really a point in many of their lives where life is starting to really hit them fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, the difficulties, the mental difficulties, the emotional difficulties are really starting to take present. They're really starting to become, real to them and they're starting to think about those things um for just people that are in churches that are leaders in churches 
what can they what can they know about young men that are in mm-hmm. middle school and high school? What are the struggles that they're facing? Mm-hmm. Um, probably a lot of the same struggles that people have always faced, but maybe they just look different now. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, I know we we talk a lot about social media, and it seems like that's probably blame for too much, but I'm always going to take the opportunity to say how social media can be used in a great way, but how it can also lead to a lot of comparison, a lot of isolation, a right. lot of I don't measure up. Um, I don't have a girlfriend and my friends do, and they're posting pictures of them all the time, just all those kind of things. Um, I think it's important for adults just to kind of think about, especially maybe adults from a little bit older, different generation, like, Students, young people have so much constant access to each other now. They always know what everyone is doing, where everyone is, exactly what you did all weekend. I feel like in other generations, um, mine included, like you left school on Friday and you might not see those people again till Monday. Right. And if they were going to call you and you were going to plan something, they were going to call you on your home phone that was plugged into the wall and your mom and dad were going to be sitting there listening to your conversation mm-hmm. while they were watching Braves baseball. Now it's like all the the texting, the Snapchatting, the social media, they're, they know everything about everybody all the time. Right. And so a lot of the, the drama, for lack of a better word, the, um, the awareness of everything that's going on with everybody and who everybody is with and what everybody's doing is, um, can just put a pressure on you, I think, that right. you have to learn how to balance. And it's been really awesome to have some guys say, you know, I don't really want this social media anymore. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes I challenge them, like, can you give this up? What's it going to end? And some of them give it up and then they have to get it back. And some of them give it up and never look back. Right. And say, I'm, that was a really great moment for me to say, I don't need that anymore. Right. Um, still, you know, just things that have kind of always been around. A lot of guys are playing sports. So figuring out how to be a leader out there, how to be a leader on the field. Um, how to get away from maybe a locker room mentality of it's okay for us to act this way because we're on the team and we're going to talk this way and and laugh this way. And you don't have to be like that. Right. Um, one of the things that I learned from an FCA guy that I really liked was just, um, you know, FCA can be a, a weekly or every other week gathering, but FCA can also be lived out and just, hey, if anybody wants to pray after practice today, I'm going to be over here. Mm-hmm. That's student led that's a hundred percent student led hey if anybody wants to hang out after practice i'm going to be right over here i'm just going to share a verse um that god gave me two minutes but establishing yourself as a leader in that in that place on that team um these guys can do that and they need to be doing that right um and then you know obviously i think there's more pressure now in every area of life to achieve greatness, you know, whether it's academically or um, athletically or whatever your hobby is, um, there's just a lot of pressure to be the best at that. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. that leads us into conversations about, you know, kids that are playing sports year round and kids that are playing tournaments on the weekends and um, not able to be involved with church as much and and those are decisions families have to make obviously i have my opinions on those right i love uh dr eddie leopard that was at fairview for a long time i've heard him say many times uh i think his sons played college baseball and he said they never ever played on a travel team Hmm. they never played on a team that kept them away from church on sunday right um and they were still able to go and and play college baseball if that was their dream or a goal that they had I would always love it when he would share that because I want people to know whether it's the the student athlete or his family, um, don't let this become your God. Don't let this become your idol. And that's a struggle. You know that. Definitely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, involvement in the local church is is, is very important. And, uh, you know, with with sports, um, you know, I think uh, think a lot of kids, uh, that's how they – grow you know i remember uh, when i was in high school the golf team was my friend group you know that was who i I was friends with it was the people i hung out with and um i so i i get that and i know for a lot of parents that's they they want their kids to have friends they want their kids to be successful and sports is kind of the avenue our culture likes to see that in and and, sports keeps you know i was thinking about this yesterday wilson like there's a lot of people that sports fills your time and keeps you from a lot of idle time and downtime and Mm -hmm. 
um, for a lot of kids keeps you out of trouble for lack of a better word. Right. And so I, I'm never, and I, you know, I coach at Blue Ridge High School and all, and half for years and am a big fan um, of all the sports that we have. Um, it's just like so many other things in life, figuring out the balance. You know? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, it comes down to priorities and, and, and what are priorities. And for a lot of students, their parents are very involved in that. So it's a, it's, it's tight, you know, kind of a tight um, line to walk. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of for a lot of students that are uh, that are growing, and, and one thing that you that you said was so cool uh, about the you know um, student that was called to missions, you probably had a lot of those conversations where kids have called you because um, they know you and they, they feel like they they can be comfortable talking to you, and maybe it's a conversation like, "Hey, I want to receive Christ," mm-hmm. or "Hey, I feel like God's called me to do this thing," or "Hey, I'm really struggling with this thing." Um, I'm ha- I'm a re- had a really bad week. Can you kind of just talk to you? And um, how important are, are those moments to you? And, uh, you know, how can, uh, you know, I imagine that's something about discipleship that people might overlook is, is those moments when you are called to because you are that safe space they can talk to. And I imagine that's a very fulfilling, just great moment to see how God's working and just help that person in that it's moment. A, another great question. Um, I think a big part of discipleship is availability. And right. time right. and um i was thinking you know i'm not here to say like kids are so different different since covid kids are so different i don't really believe that mm-hmm. the human humans are still humans and human nature the one thing that has always worked for me is just availability and time i will give you my time right um i will right. be here for you and i will be accessible to you and i um, if you text me, I will text you back. Um, and so you're exactly right, Wilson. They do, um, they'll reach out to me with some heartbreak sometimes. Hey, I just got broken up with. Mm-hmm. And yeah. there we go. And we run with that and we talk about that. Um, I love when they text me and they do this a lot. They text me with questions about the Bible. Mm, yeah. um, and most of the time, I have to go look it up. Um, use some of the resources I love the and I tell them this all the time the the app the website that's called got questions yeah it's very good is awesome yeah and and I've told them that and some of them even have that app right but they want to ask me and then I'm going to go look it up on got questions right. and then I'm either going to summarize what that says or I'm just going to send them the link and say read this or watch this video um Obviously, I want them to have a study Bible, and I want them to realize all you got to do is go down to the bottom here and read these study notes, and it might help you understand this verse that you don't quite understand. But sometimes they they want me to do that for them or me to help them with that, and I'm going to do that. Right. Um, They'll sometimes reach out to me with concerns about a friend, Mm -hmm. like burden for a friend. Will you pray for my friend? I'm trying to get my friend to come to Bible study. I'm trying to share Christ with my friend. So those are great moments too. Right. Um, I try to do this, and I, I don't do a great job every single day. But I try at the end of the day to look through my text and make sure have I texted everybody back because they do text me a lot, and right. I don't want to leave somebody out there and a week later realize I never texted you back with this question that you had or this prayer request that you had. Right. Um, so I, I try to be faithful in that. So that I'm, um, I am that approachable, accessible person for them. Absolutely. I remember I, I think of the people that have been impactful in my life, and many different people. Um, you know, it wasn't that I could regurgitate every <laughs> youth pastor let Bible study lesson we did on Wednesday nights. I couldn't, you know, say everything they ever told me. Um, I couldn't, you know, go over every one-on-one Bible study we, we went through. But I remember that if I called them, they would answer. Or if I text them, they, they you know they would they would get back to me, and uh, they were there for me. So you're right. I mean, being someone that's discipling others and 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 helping others is um that time is time is really the key. What it comes down to, and um, being there for for those kids because they know they can reach out to you and they can they can seek out you um, for guidance and um, just to be a friend. And that's extremely important in discipleship. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, you know, for pastors that are watching this, they do they do a lot of discipleship themselves, um, sometimes to big congregations, but one on one as well. Um, 
as someone who's been doing this for a long time, you've been doing these Bible studies, you've been working with kids, doing a lot of camps, um, you're pouring out a lot into other people. But you have your own spiritual life as well. You have your own spiritual condition. How do you, it's, it, it, this is really a time management question more than anything, <laughs> but how do you pour into your own life? You know, because you're, you're spending most of your week pouring into others. How do you make sure you pour into your own sure. life as well? Um, I think I mentioned I, I have some speakers that I really enjoy listening to um, that I try to listen to just for me. Mm -hmm. And that can be a struggle. And that's a, the first thing that I would say to pastors out there is, and I know they know exactly what I'm thinking or about to say, but just looking into scripture or listening to a message or reading a good book for your own development and your own relationship with the Lord and what the Lord wants to say to you and not looking at it through the lens of, I can teach this to my people. Right, that's hard. Yeah. And that that's what, that's a huge struggle for me. So. Right. I'm reading something and it's so good, but I'm already three steps ahead thinking this is how I'll teach it to my guys. Right, right. Um, I hear a great message and I'm, uh, you know, what can I do to change this and adapt this and take part of this and use it for my guys? Um, so I think being intentional and asking the Lord, hey, will you give me a word and a message mm -hmm. and an encouragement specific to me? Right. Where I am, what I'm dealing with, decisions I'm making, or encourage me. <laughs> from your word or from your truth and not just always for your flock. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's been good for me, but it is an ongoing thing all the time. And right. it's, you know, it's not a bad thing because it means that you're being used by the Lord and that you do, or you are burdened for your flock. Definitely. That's but definitely right. Yeah. Obviously we have to take care of ourselves too. Another thing I struggle with Wilson is I mentioned, I listen to a lot of messages um, I listen to them in the car. I listen to them when I'm getting ready in the morning. And I struggle with that because I can't always remember them. I can't, I rarely remember them, to be honest. I'm right. a note taker. And so if I'm driving in the car, I'm not taking notes on the sermon that I'm listening to. Um, and I'm thinking, this is really, really good. But I'll get like burdened sometimes that God didn't get as much out of that as I should have. And I've talked to people about that and I've kind of come to the conclusion of filling your mind and your ears and your, and your heart with good preaching and with God's word. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, right. whether I can rattle off all three points that the guy made, whether I can share that message with somebody else and explain what I heard, whether I can do that or not, there were a lot of other things I could have been thinking about and dwelling on and filling my mind and my ears with, and I chose to fill it with a sermon or with God's word in that in that time. And so that's always going to be the best choice. Right. So I've had to kind of free myself a little bit from this, you know, I put pressure on myself to what were the big takeaways from this message by David Platt that I just listened to, right. where maybe it's just, I just heard a really great message and I think I'm going to have a great day. You know? That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, another thing that you're, you're very involved with is you work with a lot of different camps, you know, um, and if I start naming them, you know, I'll, I'll, I won't name them all. So I won't, I won't even try, but you work with a lot, of, a lot of camps as well. And I imagine there are a lot of kids that come to Bible study also come to the camps, but um, those are probably larger crowds, bigger groups for sure. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Love it. I've worked uh, a lot of summers with Fuge Camps, which mm -hmm. is part of Lifeway, uh, Lifeway Christian Resources of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and we have Fuge Camp at North Greenville, so most people are familiar with it around here because they've seen our flags flying in the summer. Right. Um, but we have 13 or 14 different teams across the country. We have probably 25, 30 locations where we do Fuge Camp. Um, so it's been a really important part of my story. Um, started working there back in the 90s when I went to camp with our church, with mm -hmm. First Baptist Travelers Rest. I went as a chaperone. I went as an adult. Um, and I loved it. And I had what we call a life-changing week as an adult. Um, and so after doing that for a few summers, I just asked some of the staffers, because I'm teaching by this point, do y'all ever hire teachers? Because most of the people that worked camp were college students, seminary students. I said, do y'all ever hire teachers? I said, we love to hire teachers. If, if your availability, your dates work. Uh, so I started working for Fuge Camps, mm -hmm. um, and have been with them ever since. And it's just such an important part of the year for me um, because I get to be with students in a different setting. Mm -hmm. um, the school setting, there are 
rules, there are tests, there are standards, right. there is discipline. Um, camp is just an opportunity to be with kids. And I, I tell uh, the people at school, and sometimes I even tell my principal, I say working at camp makes me a better teacher. Because at camp, we care about kids. We build relationships with kids in a really short amount of time. We learn names really quickly. We sit and we talk with kids. We make kids feel valued. Right. We say, I want to hear your story. I'm interested in what you're interested in. Oh, you're on the basketball team. Talk to me about it. We do a lot of relationship building, um, especially as a middle school teacher. Relationships are the foundation and the key of everything. Mm -hmm. And so bringing that mindset and that model uh, into the school setting is, is awesome because I want to be that same person to the students in my class that I am to kids at camp. Um, I do get to preach at camp, which is is my favorite thing. It's exhausting. Right. Um, <laughs> but preach usually four or five nights a week. Um, we have different sessions, and they only last for a week. So basically every Tuesday night of the summer, I'm preaching the same message. Right. So... To our pastors out there, it probably does get a little better as the summer goes on. That doesn't mean, you know, avoid the first week of camp. Right. Um, but even I've had the opportunity, I know some of our pastors do. If you preach two sermons on Sunday morning, sometimes the second one, you preach the same message twice. You have two services. Sometimes by the second one, you're, okay, I might do this a little differently, you know, right. even though there's only been an hour between the two. And so um, it can be a struggle, though, like, the weeks of camp fly by in the summer and it, all of a sudden I look up and I realize it's Tuesday night again and I'm about to preach this message again and it feels like I just preached it about 24 hours ago. So keeping it fresh, realizing that crowd out there hasn't heard this message right. and uh, I believe needs to hear this message. And of course that message fits with our themes for the day. We have a theme for the summer and a theme for each day. And um, I just kind of love everything about camp. Right, so. right. Um, and I imagine speaking to large crowds and, you know, it's a little different than it your, is. than your one, than your small group discipleship. Um, but, uh, that's probably another place where you get a lot of questions after a lot of one-on-one -on -one time after as well. And, uh, I imagine, you know, just to kind of talk about the Lord's faithfulness, um, and, and what, how God has worked through them, uh, through the camps. I mean, I imagine you'll see a lot of salvations. We do. We do. We see a lot of. Um, life change, like I mentioned, we see um, people called into ministry and people mm -hmm. called into missions. We see um, first-time believers in Christ. We started something new a couple of years ago that I love. Um, always at our, we have a camp in Northern California that I love, and I've worked there a lot. And there's a bell there at that camp um, that any person that receives Christ for the first time rings that bell at the end of their week of camp. That's not specific, just a fuge. It's just something that that camp location has always had in place. Mm -hmm. But we loved it. And so um, probably two summers ago, we sent started sending a bell to every one of our locations. Wow. And so we have a time on the last morning where students come up and ring that bell. And sometimes it's a kid that you've had a conversation with or one of our Bible study leaders has had a conversation with that kid. And sometimes it's a kid that you've loved all week long or you've been on the rec field or had a meal with them, but you didn't know because there's five or 600 kids at camp. You didn't know how God was working in that student's life. And then I call them up on the last morning. I invite them up. If you made a first-time decision for Christ, line up over here to my left to come through and ring this bell. And I look out of the corner of my eye and I see a kid in that line over there that I didn't know was going to be in that line over there. And it's an awesome moment. Yeah. And then on the other side, we have our staff and they do a tunnel thing that kids run through and just encourage them. And people celebrate and cheer and we talk about all of heaven celebrates and it's a pretty great moment. Right. Um, I'm always going to say, you mentioned conversations at camp. I'm always going to say, I think I'm a whole lot better one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. So, I almost hesitated to to apply for camp the first summer because I'm not that wild and crazy guy. I'm not a, you know, entertain a ton of people with my craziness. Um, right. But one-on-one, -on -one, if I have an opportunity to sit down with a kid at camp and meet with them during free time and um, hear from them and pray with them, those are the moments that I love. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've been able, I believe, to take some groups on some mission trips as well. Yeah. Um, maybe some small groups. I'm a, Imagine that's really cool, especially for, you know, you get to see young Christians go over to a different area, different culture, and see how those people experience Christianity and share the gospel with other people. Um, uh, can you kind of 
Test to that. I imagine that's a really cool thing. That started in 2011. And the way it started was I had worked at the camp in Ecuador that I mentioned through Fuge Camps. Right. So I had spent two summers um, in Ecuador. I knew what they did there. I knew what a what an incredible experience it is um, to hear the stories of the missionaries, to see the way God has worked there, mm-hmm. to see their faithfulness and being there for so many years, to meet the believers, the Ecuadorian believers, to get in the boats. And anybody who's ever been there knows exactly what I'm talking about. You get in the boat and you ride down the river and you go into the jungle and the, you go up into these villages and do VBS. And it's just this, it's an incredible first international mission experience. Right. And so in 2011, um, I believe totally from the Lord, God said, how awesome would it be if you took some of these guys from Blue Ridge, some of these guys that are coming to your Bible studies and took them to Ecuador, mm-hmm. a place that you love, a place that you've been, um, people that you trust and you know. And so we did that in 2011. We took probably 30 guys down there. We took several adults. Um, Bill Fister, who was the pastor at Locust Hill at the time, he had been a missionary in Argentina. Um, And so he spoke fluent Spanish. His son Ford was in high school. Ford's now at Berea First Baptist. You need to have him on your podcast. He's an amazing guy. Um, But Dr. Fister and and his son Ford went with us, and they – were, were great. They knew the culture. They knew Spanish. We had all these guys. It was incredible. Um, and so from that time on, starting in 2011, um, I said, let's, that was spring break. Let's set spring break apart for missions um, because my summers are full with camp. Um, but let's do something over spring break every year. And so God kind of gave us the model of let's do something international every other year because an international undertaking is pretty big. It's expensive. Um, it's a lot more planning. And so let's do something within the U.S. on the even-numbered years, and let's go out of the country on the odd-numbered years. Right. And so we've done that pretty faithfully. Um, COVID threw us off for a couple of years, obviously, but um, we were pretty consistent going to Ecuador. We went to Ecuador in 2023, spring break. Um, we'll go again in 2025. Awesome. Um, and then this year, spring break, uh, just about a um, little over a month ago, we went to Salt Lake City right. and uh, worked with a church plant out there um, and met with Dr. Travis Kearns, watched your podcast with Dr. Right. Kearns, um, and were prepared for that in a lot of ways, but also not prepared mm-hmm. for everything that we actually learned when we got there. Wow. And when yeah. we went to the to the LDS, Latter-day Saints, to their visitor center and interacted with their people and saw... The, the stronghold that that mm-hmm. um, false religion has on that place, on that state. Right. Um, and learned a lot more about their beliefs, which are fascinating and completely wrong. Right. Um, right. <laughs> and so that was a great experience. Yeah. Um, there's a guy named Braden Ray. I don't know if you know Braden. Oh, He's yeah. in North Greenville yeah. now. Braden, right. um, so burdened for that. Spent mm-hmm. last summer out there. So the connections... For us to be able to get in and, and get connected out there, because a lot of our local churches are connected out there, there's a really strong partnership right now between South Carolina and the state of Utah, and I right. love that. Right. And so we got to be a little part of that this past spring break. Right. Um, we did some other things, um, a few things we did over Christmas break. I think I mentioned we've been to the Philippines. Hmm. Um, we also went to China twice, wow. uh, like 2015 and 2016. Amazing trips wow. where I would think, I am walking around in China right now with a bunch of guys from Blue Ridge. Like, right. <laughs> how did this happen? Yeah. Um, but working with IMB missionaries there, and yeah, um, those are life changing trips and times that those guys will never forget. Certainly, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, we spoke a lot today about you know God's faithfulness um, in in working in these young men through you, and I know a lot of people have been impacted, myself included. Um, by by what you have what you have done and and your investment in these young kids' lives, um, your investment in your time and your investment in pouring the word into them and then living it out in your own life. So thank you for that. I know I speak for many young men um, when I say that. So thank you for um, what you have done. And uh, I guess I'm also speaking for many older men now too. I hate to I hate to say that. That's right. In terms of dating, but um, I know I speak for a lot of people that you've had a great impact on many lives and um god has god has been faithful and working through you so thank you thank you for that is there anything else you wanted to mention go over for before we get ready to close i know we're coming up on an hour here so it's been great and thank you
Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Stimes. Thank you for coming on and um, and sharing sharing with us and um, praying for you as you continue to go. Uh, I did want if anyone wants to get involved in future camps. I imagine y'all still take volunteers. I mean, how can people get involved? Absolutely, contact me. I'm pretty easy to find. Blue Ridge Middle School. Most people have my number, but let me know. I'd love to talk to you about camp. Um, if you have a maybe a smaller church in the area that maybe just has a part time youth minister or a small youth ministry. Um, Fuge Camps is a great opportunity for them because you can get some pretty high quality programming, um, music, the speaker, not so much, but <laughs> you can get some pretty awesome programming yeah, yeah. for, you know, that's that smaller church that only has eight or 10 youth. We'd love for you to come. Um, we have we have church groups there of all sizes. Right. And so your kids are going to get to be part of something bigger for a week in the summer. So I'd love to talk to anybody about that and let you know about our locations, whether you want to travel you know, pretty close around here. Um, I'm down a lot at SWU, Southern Wesleyan. We have a location there right beside Clemson. Awesome. So that's a little distance of, you know, 45 minutes or an hour. We've got North Greenville, but we've got other places if you want to get on the road a little bit. I just love to talk about camp. If there's a parent out there that has a young man that um, is in eighth grade through 12th grade right. that you'd like to be part of Bible study, we really just sort of spread by word of mouth. An invitation so anyone could reach out to me. Sometimes we might have a, a guy who's homeschooled or um, in some other virtual setting or something, but could use that connection. We always welcome them. So right. No membership requirements. Just reach out to me. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Stein. It's been an honor. Thank you, Wilson. Yes, sir. I'm Wilson Paris, and that's a good word.